Start at the podium and then move to the uh, to the, the table. Um, so we're going to have a panel discussion, and I'm going to uh, start out uh, because I have the microphone. I'm going to start out with a couple questions that I have that I've shared uh, with our panelists. Um, but I want to, and then we're going to we have some microphones up front um, that that people can come to, and I'll call on you. But we're going to have rules because in our new reimagined story told society, there still will be rules. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but they're nice rules. They'll be rules with kittens. So the first thing, uh, and this is going to sound incredibly obvious, but the first thing when you come to the microphone with a question, you should formulate a question. <laughs> Rule number one. I'm so glad that you know what I'm talking about. So a question, 30 seconds maybe, is, is how long it takes to ask a question. If the audience is getting nervous that a question isn't coming, maybe display that nervousness a little bit. So it's not less a time for public comment. Tim told us at breakfast this morning uh, that in Chicago in the fall that uh, somebody wouldn't give out the microphone, and he got up and walked down the aisle and took it from him. <laughs> I wouldn't make Tim mad. So I'll start with, uh, with this question, which I think touches on the theme of, of this event. Uh, various critics have remarked that it seems easier for us to imagine the end of the world, the end of the world, than it does for us to imagine the end of capitalism. Uh, contemporary films and novels, even TV series, some of which I, I confess to be addicted to, uh, are rife with apocalyptic narratives, which seem to be the only kind of post-capitalistic post narrative that we can imagine. W why is this so hard? Why is it so hard for us to imagine scenes and narratives of an actual functioning, ecologically healthy world beyond this doom-extractive society? And help us here. What would make it easier for us to imagine that world? Maybe we'll just have each person in kind. Kathy, what, you want to start? Well, I think it's a really good question, and I think a lot of uh, the reason that there are so many post-apocalyptic stories out there is people are trying to come to terms with this. You know, they're trying to figure it out, and stories are often the way we do that. So why aren't we coming up with the, the imagination stories, the possible stories? I think one reason is that in academia and in the left, you get much more status by cutting something down than by proposing something. If you try to propose something, then your smarter colleague or comrade will tell you how wrong you are. If you tell somebody how wrong you are, they'll go, oh. Okay, so that's one thing, and that's a, that's a habit we can change. <clears throat> Actually, second, Michael and I think you're wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. We can start right off with some disagreement. Um, so a second thing is that I think the mainstream media and the mainstream culture has a theory of how change happens. Their theory of how change happens is that important white men in suits make decisions and then things are different. And our theory of change at Yes Magazine and I think a lot of other people is that change, the real change, the really radical enough change happen because ordinary people and especially people on the margins make it happen. And because the mainstream media doesn't believe in that kind of change, it doesn't see that kind of change. It's invisible, so it doesn't get reported on. So the real work that's, being, that's happening in our culture that is actually the parts of a vision of a new society, which I think people are not just talking about, I think they're doing, those things are invisible because to the dominant culture they don't exist. Great example of that happened in Seattle during the WTO. You may remember the 
thousands of people showed up in Seattle and shut that conference down. Well, the mainstream media had no idea that was going to happen because all those movements were invisible to them. So, you know, I think, I think don't pay attention to, to, uh, to uh, what the mainstream media is doing. The important stuff is happening around the edges. And I think there's a very strong uh, both racial and gender bias to that because an awful lot of the most important work is happening in communities of color and an awful lot of the most important work is led by women. And those are especially invisible to the status quo. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at the work as adding up to the new story that's emerging that people are creating from the ground up, I think that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing it. Um, I, th I think starting um, a as you did on your second point there about who it is that's putting together those stories, those uh, apocalyptic narratives of, of the end of the world sort of stuff um, is a good way to start answering this question of why, we, why it's easier to picture the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, because those who are winning in capitalism, those for whom capitalism works, they want the rest of us to believe that the only alternative is, is complete collapse turning to, um, you know, really end of the world apocalyptic narratives where we're eating each other's faces and, um, you know, where it's zomb zombie, zombie films. Like, they, they want us to believe that, you know, it's either, it's either corporate multinational capitalism or a, a zombie apocalypse. Um, um, you know, it's because, because if they had people actually envisioning um, a different way other than corporate capitalism that's not that really ugly collapse, um, people would start working towards that uh, because they know people are dissatisfied. Um, and, and that's the other piece of it, that, um, that the end of the world narratives that are increasingly popular, popular um, are responding to a, a, genuine, uh, a genuine feeling in a lot of the population um, that we are reaching all these limits and, and this path that we're on can't continue much longer um, and you know, this, this system is gonna have to end in one way or another um, and for those who create so much of the media that we consume, um, they want us to believe that the only way this system will end um, is in that really horrific, ugly zombie apocalypse sort of way. I think that some of this has to do with some of the um, enthusiasm for stories of apocalypse. It has to do with the same sort of comic book syndrome that we were talking about before. That, you know, people, and why do people watch violence on TV? It's attractive, it sells, it sells. Uh, and the kazam and the kablam and the gaboo and all that stuff um, it appeals to people's sense of, of, of I don't know what. <laughs> but yeah. so that seems to be an adolescent thing. And that, that this work of creating the new world is a kind of a grown up job. Not that we can't be childlike in our joy and childlike in our imagination, but that it's going to take hard work. And I think one of the reasons why, in answer to your question about what might make it easier, Michael, um, one of the problems is that it seems so big. You have to reimagine everything, and the whole project floats. It has no metaphysical grounding. It, it, you have no starting point. Um, it, it, everything depends on everything else, and nothing is rooted. So I would suggest that we do have a model for how our society could work very well, and that we ignore it to our peril, and that we ignore it all the time, and that is information about how the world actually works. How do plant and animal communities thrive? How do they share and recycle water? How do, how do the natural cycles of, of, of renewal work? And that if we sit down and think about how we might learn from the earth itself, how we might listen to the ways of the world, how we might bring our ethics and our practices in line, aligned with the way the world works, that we have a starting point at least um, that we might model our projects after.
So I'll ask uh, one more question for the three of them, and then uh, we can take questions at the microphone. Uh, some people, maybe lots of people, uh, are not going to take part in what we might call the noisy stuff, the public stuff, the stuff that might end in incarceration. Uh, if we're going to start a group, if we were going to start a group, and let's call that group Introverts for Climate Change or Climate Action, <laughs> what projects could those people take on? Well, actually, prison is a great place for introverts. Um, a, as an introvert, um, a, as an introvert, uh, being an introvert helps you do time, actually. Makes it uh, a lot easier to do because it's a very introspective sort of place um, with uh, highly negative consequences for sticking your nose into other people's business too much. Um, so it helps to be an introvert in prison. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, I understand what your question is asking, um, <laughs> that, um, that certainly not, that, that sort of thing is not what we need everyone to be doing, um, and it's, and, and it's not for everyone, um, but, uh, but I do challenge the, the idea that, that is implicit in a lot of that, that, um, that giving something up isn't everyone's job in this. Um, you know, often that question is, is structured as, um, well, you know, there's all these reasons that I can't go to prison because I would have to give up all these things. Um, and, you know, prison is not for everybody. Uh, <laughs> but, but there are... <laughs> yeah. Approaching everybody. So, some of us can handle it better than others. Um, <laughs> But uh, but some but people do. I, I challenge the notion that there is an easy and convenient path uh, to make significant change, um, and and that's what what I think that we have to accept. Um, that you might not have to risk incarceration, um, but you will probably have to risk stepping outside of your comfort zone. Um, you will probably have to risk. Uh, risking your reputation. You might have to risk your career. Um, you know, you might have to risk a comfortable lifestyle. Um, what it, whatever it may be. Um, you know, and, and, and the, and, I, and I've gotten that question about what's the place for introverts in this movement before, um, and I didn't understand it the first time. Um, so I was like, well, my place is an all right place for, <laughs> for introverts. Um, that uh, that meeting these challenges doesn't necessarily mean doing it in a comfortable way. Um, that it's not like, oh, just do the same thing that you're doing um, and and have a climate related related influence on it, or just spin it in a climate direction. Um, you know, in uh, in 2008, um, after I had gotten very concerned about climate change and it had pretty much become uh, my main focus. Um, I was an economics student at the University of Utah at the time, um, studying alternative measures of well-being, alternatives to the GDP. And, uh, and I thought that my role in the climate movement would be being the wonky economist guy that's always talking about alternatives to the GDP. Um, but it turned out that the climate movement had plenty of wonky economists, um, and they needed more people pushing the boundaries and taking risks um, and showing that that was okay. Um, you know, that's, that's where the job opening was, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of how responsibility works. You know, we don't necessarily get to choose, um, our responsibility. Sometimes it chooses us, um, and sometimes we find that, uh, we're suited for something that we never would have expected. Uh, you know, I, I had never given a public speech before I disrupted that auction. Um, and was suddenly vaulted into this very public position in the climate movement um, and, and found out that there were certain aspects of this position that, that I was good at. Uh, and I never would have expected that. Um, I, I never would have sat down and said, um, well, well here's, here's the things that I'm comfortable with and the things that I'm good at. Um, th this whole position never would have fit into that. Um, and, and so I think finding our place uh, in the movement has to mean a little bit of uh, uh, 
open ourselves up to, to the opportunities that arise um, and, and getting in over our head sometimes. That's, that's, I think, really true and really beautifully said, Tim. You know, Sandra Steingraber, do you know her? A great foe of, of <clears throat> chemicals and toxins and fracking, particularly toxin, uh, was once asked, is often asked, Sandra, you are so courageous. You are just the picture of courage. How do you do it? And she said, I am afraid all the time. And that's a pretty interesting definition of courage to me, is to be afraid all the time and go out and do it anyway. Um, but I have an idea for those who don't like that response at all. And <laughs> <laughs> this is a multiple choice answer. Um, the problem we face is silence. There are so many people who care and don't say a word and who are embarrassed to even mention the subject. Why not call them out just a tiny little bit? Is it, if, if you're an introvert, would it be okay to get a piece of typing paper and put a sign in your window that says, I care about climate change? I mean, could you do that? Could you put up a sign that says climate change is real, it's dangerous, it's upon us? Could you put up a piece of, type of pa typing paper that says stop fossil fuels? I mean, you don't, you don't have to be out on the street. Just if people would stand up and be counted, that I think would make a big difference. So that when uh, you said, how many people support the carbon tax at the wellhead? Um, Regulating carbon mm -hmm. by 55 percent of Republicans, 80 some of Democrats. Okay, 85, 80 percent of Democrats, 55 percent of Republicans. Where are they? You know, you're so surprised by that response. Um, what if they just, if, if you, if we all could go around our neighborhood and say, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about climate change. Are you? And they would say, yeah, but you know, I'm not going to get out there. Say, here is a piece of typing paper. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up and be counted. I think we're called to transform ourselves at the same time as we're transforming the world. And that's not a process that happens in isolation, even among introverts. I think we, we change in relationship. We, we change when we allow ourselves to be with people who are different than us, who challenge us. We change when we allow ourselves to be deeply immersed in the natural world, even if the natural world is in the middle of a city. I think we change in relationship, and that takes a kind of courage too, and maybe even more so for introverts. But it, it, the the process that we're in is will take the rest of our lives. This this will not be something that will happen, and then, as Tim said, we were, we are not going back to normal. This is a, a process that we'll be in for the long haul. So how do we know what to do? I don't think we know what to do by ourselves. I think what we, when we know what to do, it's because we have put ourselves into those challenging relationships, into, into relationships where we don't know what to do, into relationships where some other people may be wiser than us or they may be more challenging. They may, they may uh, take us out of our comfort zone. And that's how we figure out what to do and what to be next. And then we do it again and again and again. So we do iterations of transformation. I just want to add one more little thing. Uh, often I get that question in, in the context of um, what about for people who don't have the courage to take those steps? Um, and I say, that's okay, just fake it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of authenticity, but courage might be the one area where authenticity is overrated. <laughs> That's great. I have a whole notebook full of um, questions, but I'm also an incredibly generous person, so um, <laughs> you know that. So we uh, maybe have some questions from the microphone, uh, we have one on each side. Let's start here. Thanks for your generosity, Michael. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I, 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 I wish I could have been here to hear Sarah and Kathleen talk. I couldn't be here, but I heard Tim, and so I'm kind of coming off of that one. I don't know if you've addressed it already. Um, 
and you kind of led, the, led my question with your uh, mentioning the word capitalism. Uh, so I'm going to try to eliminate the formulation <clears throat> and go straight to um, why don't um, more, more of us actually name capitalism uh, as, as the driver of us in this train wreck that we're in? Uh, why isn't the seriousness brought out? We can go cautiously and we can use the word post-capitalism or we can say corporate capitalism, but we all know capitalism will morph in however it needs to. So um, I, I have a kind of a need for that. Part two is um, why don't we hear patriarchy mentioned? Because to me that under, underlies class system and all the oppressions that we have. It brings us hierarchy. And w I, it's the root. Okay. So, so I, patri uh, uh, capitalism and patriarchy. Let's do this. Let's do. Let's ask three questions. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, and then our panelists each can pick part of one of those three to answer. That way, more people uh, can participate. So, okay. Tim, I wanted to ask about your time in prison. I have this image of you getting your lunch served on that segmented tray and then figuring out where to sit down in the cafeteria and. You know, sitting down and going through that that routine of so what are you in for, you know, how are you perceived in there, and did you have a voice, you know, a space to have your your voice what in the during the time that where you you were in there, do people care about environmentalism inside of a prison? So Tim, you hold on to that one. I, I'm pretty sure that one was for you. <laughs> You've done time, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> one more. Um, I was also inspired by what Tim said um, about that we need to have people to facilitate the grieving process for what we're losing, and that's something that I have been really contemplating is how do we do that? It seems like a lot of this work is um, issue-driven. You put out the brush fire, but the reason people burn out is because there isn't that sustained interpersonal connection. And my interest is to really know how to build the safe communities to have you know, the heartfelt connections and conversations, and to do it in a sustained way so that when the pain comes up, when people's personal triggers come up, to have a way to facilitate that. And I guess what skill sets do you need to be able to do that? Great, so we have a, a good, thank you. The, we have a question, sort of why don't we talk about capitalism and patriarchy uh, and or patriarchy? Uh, question about Tim's time in, in the slammer. Uh, and a, a question about facilitating the grieving process. Tim, yours is more straightforward. Okay. <laughs> um, so my 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 time in prison. Um, yeah, there there was a. Uh, I got a lot of strange looks when because because normally uh, people don't ask too many questions uh, when when you first get locked up. Uh, it's kind of frowned upon to ask too many questions about somebody's case. Um, because that's like being nosy and a good sign of being a rat. Um, and, uh, and so people just ask, uh, is it drugs or money? Um, <laughs> be, because in the federal system, that's why most people are there, you know, either for drugs or for not paying their taxes. Um, and, uh, and I would say neither, it's politics. <laughs> I, I'd say I'm a political prisoner. Um, and, and I'd say it was a civil disobedience case and um, then I'd explain more. Um, and, uh, and, and so I was actually in five different institutions. Uh, and so I had that experience uh, of coming into a new institution several times and with a new population of folks. Um, and, uh, and just being a political prisoner, there's an automatic level of respect for that um, because everybody who's in the federal system um, hates the federal government. Um, <laughs> and, and so being there as somebody who stood up to that um, and called out the injustice in that system um, just afforded me an automatic level of respect. Um, so that, that immediately made time easier to do. Um, and, uh, you know, was, especially once I got settled into the, the main institution that I was at for a lot of my time uh, in Herlong, California, um, uh, there were people there that started getting articles that, that I was in. Um, and there were, after I'd been there a few weeks, uh, there was a, a guy that I passed that I hadn't really talked to before, and he goes, hey, 
you know you're in Rolling Stone this month. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and then there were a few other articles that came in that kind of got passed around, and so then people got um, more of the story, because uh, I didn't talk about it all that much, because uh, I'm an introvert. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I really went into it, uh, you were talking about maintaining my voice, um, and whether I was an, sort of an activist on the inside. Um, and I went into it not planning on that. Um, I went into it thinking, okay, this is my vacation for a couple of y years. Um, uh, I'm gonna keep my head down and just do my time. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then I learned the lesson that uh, a lot of folks learn who just try to keep their head down uh, and not make any waves is that there's no safety in silence. Um, and so I ended up uh, getting locked up in isolation um, for an email that I had sent uh, to a friend of mine who was an organizer um, and she was supporting me a lot while I was locked up um, and coordinating a lot of a lot of things with uh, Peaceful Uprising for me. Um, and uh, there was a, a company that had donated to my legal defense fund and, and I'd heard a rumor that they were exporting all their US jobs uh, and shipping them overseas. And, and so I sent her an email and said, see what you can find out about this, um, see if the workers are organizing, um, any resistance, you know, obviously if that money they gave me came from shortchanging their workers, then I can't accept it and I'd like to give it away. Um, and, and I said, on my part, I'll write a letter to the owner of the company um, who was somebody that I knew uh, and see what was going on. And, and, and I said in the, in the email that I sent to my friend Dylan, I said, if it turns out to be true, uh, I'll, I'll threaten to, uh, in the letter, I'll threaten to give the money away uh, and speak out against them if it turns out to be true. Um, and a couple days later, I got called into the lieutenant's office. Um, and he said, oh, I'm getting uh, calls from Washington, D.C. saying I gotta lock you up because you're making threats to people. Um, <laughs> and, and I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, it's right here in this email. I was like, if you've got that email, you can clearly see that I'm not threatening anyone. And, and he said, well, you use the word threat. <laughs> and, and I said, I could have said it looks like there's a threat of rain. It doesn't mean I'm gonna hurt somebody. <laughs> And, and we had this very Kafkaesque conversation for a while. Um, and finally he said, well, look, when I get these requests from Washington, I gotta do something about it to make it look like I'm taking it seriously. So I gotta put you in isolation. Um, and so they locked me up. Um, and uh, you know, while I was in there, I found out that you know, they generally keep people in there for 90 days for investigation to determine if they'd done anything wrong. Um, and, and I had prepared for repercussions like this um, when I got locked up with Dylan, uh, my friend that was coordinating things for me. Um, and, and we had used phone trees before in Peaceful Uprising and I said, uh, you know, find, find all the phone numbers you can from the warden all the way up through the National Bureau of Prisons, through the Department of Justice, all the way up. Um, and, and if something happens to me, trigger the phone tree and barrage all those numbers with phone calls. Um, and so I was able to get word out after a few weeks uh, to Dylan about what was going on. Um, and so she triggered the phone tree, she sent out uh, press releases, um, and so suddenly there were thousands of phone calls into the Bureau of Prisons, um, and, and the, the media was going nuts with it and calling the, uh, the prison. Um, and they let me out of isolation less than 24 hours later <laughs> from when the phone calls started. Um, and, and so then I got sent back into the general population and um, then all the other inmates had found out what had happened at that point. Um, and their reaction was sort of like, wait a minute, you can fight back against these people? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and you know, they knew that I was an activist. They knew that I was there for uh, an activist offense but I don't think they really internalized what that meant, that, that activism was people who are outside of any authoritative power structure who exercise power in their own way. Um, I don't think they got that until they saw that happen. And so then people started coming to me with all these other issues. Um, <laughs> like, how do you think we can bring more attention to this? What do you think we can do about this? Um, uh, and, and so then I started working with all of, all of them. Um, and, and at that point I said, well, you know, so much for keeping my head down. Um, <laughs> 
you know, if there's, if there's no safety in silence, then I might as well uh, fight back. Um, and, and then two weeks later, uh, they said, we're transferring you to Colorado. <laughs> um, and uh, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the, the first part of your question about, you picture me going through the line with the food tray and then turning around, where am I gonna sit? Um, you know, especially the federal prisons were very, uh, where, where people were there for a long time. Um, they, they have sort of like this informal welcoming committee um, where as soon as you come in, um, I mean, they, they give you everything you need. They explain how everything's gonna work. I mean, um, the, the inmates take a lot of ownership over new people that come in um, because they realize that that's how they have power in, their, in, in shaping the kind of society that they want. Um, within that prison. Um, and I mean that in a positive way. Um, I mean, they realize that you have power over that which you take responsibility for. Um, and that's why it's so offensive to, to r go to the guards with anything, to, to rat to the guards, um, because they never take any responsibility for anybody. Um, and so they don't deserve to have that power. Um, uh, the, the one exception um, was the private prison that I was at in Pahrump, Nevada. Um, it was a transfer center, um, and so everybody moves through there a lot. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no continuity in, in the population there. Um, and, and when I was getting booked in, uh, I only spoke to one prison official the whole time, um, and, and he called me into a room and asked what gangs I was part of, uh, and I said, none. And he said, well, when you were at county jail, what kind of people did you hang out with? And I said, well, pretty much everybody. Um, and he said, well, it's not like that here. Uh, you'll be told where the white tables are, um, and, and you're expected to sit in those, uh, and, and don't try to disrupt that system. Um, and I was like, what is he talking about? Um, and, and sure enough, the first meal, then once I got into the unit, the first meal, everybody was in line, um, and uh, I was standing there with another guy who had come in the same time as me, uh, who was a white guy, um, and, and another white inmate came up to us, and he said, um, so the first three tables there are for whites, um, and we've got a seat for you guys at the second table, um, and, and it was all racially segregated there. Um, and, uh, and I was kind of like, how could this be? Like, there was a whole chapter in American history about white people and black people being able to sit down at the same table and <laughs> eat lunch together. Um, you know, <laughs> now this is 2011, and, and, and we're being divided like this, um, and, it came, and it came from the authorities uh, that, uh, that used that as a system of control uh, in order to divide people. Okay, I'm gonna respond to the question about capitalism. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons, some of it is our, that, that we don't hear more about the, the way in which capitalism is driving a lot of the crises. One of the reasons goes all the way back to the Red Scare. A lot of people got trained that you don't use words like socialism and capitalism. Another thing I think is our confusion about what the term means. I think some people, when they talk about capitalism, mean anything that involves private property or small business, and other people are really talking about the corporate control of our economy and our society. And I think it's really worth getting clarity about that, because in my own view, the, the way in which global corporations operate with private shareholder ownership, I think the way in which that operates is intrinsically destructive because it, it takes responsibility and separates it from ownership. You can own shares in a company and have no responsibility for what it does. And it makes corporations behave as though they were blind and deaf and dumb and everything else where the only thing they can sense is the profit. And that makes them intrinsically amoral and in many cases immoral. So I think we need to, I, when I first started working at YES, I would, you know, people would say, well, the way to make change is to get these huge corporations that are so powerful, get them on our side, and then we can really get sustainability. So I was kind of, I, you know, I wanted to be really empirical about this, not ideological. So I was really looking for those examples. And every once in a while, I'd find a company that was doing something really good. But once you dig a little deeper, you find out that they're at least in part, in, in many cases, 
wholly privately owned, not publicly traded on, this, on the stock market. So an owner can choose, if he or she chooses to, they can choose to do good without having shareholders requiring that they put profit first. But I did not find publicly traded corporations that on the whole were doing good. They may have a green corporate headquarters or a green roof on their, you know. <laughs> but on the whole, the, the main thrust was profit oriented. So if that's what you mean by capitalism, I think that's very important to call out. If you start lumping in small business, mom and pop businesses, personally, I love those kinds of businesses. It, you know, it, not all of them, obviously, but I love the, the vitality and the creativity that comes when an individual or a family or a small group of people who have an idea can go out and make it happen. I actually spent a couple of weeks traveling in Cuba studying their healthcare system, which I absolutely adore. But one of the things I noticed was that if you had an idea for opening up a hair salon and you had people who needed haircuts, you could not do that. <laughs> and that seems like it's an unnecessary squelching of human creativity. So I think it's really important to make a distinction between the kind of small business that happens in almost an ecological way that weaves together needs and offerings, is locally rooted, is owned by people who have those multiple perspectives on the world, they care about their community, they care about their family, they care about the future, to make a distinction between that and big corporations. Because if you lump them all together, you get very confused. And the last thing I'll say is that if you do, if you look at the polling, I don't have the polling in front of me, unfortunately, but if you look at the polling data, uh, especially among young people, the word socialism is now a more popular word than the word capitalism. So that's an indication of something, I think. <laughs> Yeah, the only thing I would add to what you said, I, I, which I, I thought was very perceptive, is that there's this old saying that, that, the, that, that the creature that knows the least about water is the largemouth bass. And the point of that is that if you swim in it, you don't know it's there. And I think we've swum for so long in capitalism and patriarchy that we're really not paying much attention to what it is and what it's doing. And I think particularly if you ask young people about patri patriarchy, they'll just go, what are you talking about? If you, and if you ask them about capitalism, they'll think, well, is there any other way? So it is an educational job to be done. So we come to grief. <laughs> I would challenge that. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I gotta challenge that. Um, if and he's not even an academic. <laughs> if you go to... <laughs> he's learning though, isn't he? If you go to, if you go to organizing that's actually youth-led, um, that, that, that is driven by young people, they're gonna talk about patriarchy. It is part of the conversation in the youth climate movement. Um, it's there, I mean, uh, it, yeah. far more so than older generations, frankly. And, and I would venture to say that we're both right, because I think that once a person is in the youth-led movement, that they, they get it. And uh, that may not be true of the population as a whole. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because it's about grief now. And, um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we know a lot about grief. You know, we are creatures who die. And we know it from the very beginning of our lives that we are creatures who will die. And it's part of our way of living in the world. And, and when you think about the patterns of grief, you can see it played out completely, literally, in the same steps uh, in the climate change movement. So people talk about the first step of grieving is denial. Well, we're certainly seeing a lot of that in the climate movement. What, this can't be happening, this isn't happening. The scientists are some kind of an eco-wacko communist plot. The second stage is anger. You know, I'm so, I cannot believe that, that the corporations will be doing this to us, or I can't believe that the scientists would be lying to us like this. The third stage of grief is bargaining. Oh, we see ourselves bargaining with this. Well, sure, you can build your pipeline here, but we'll put certain restrictions on this pipeline here. Or, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll um, stop you from logging this tropical forest, but go ahead over here. Or if you want to destroy this, this indigenous group of people, that's fine, or take their water, but don't do it over here. All the bargains, and particularly by these big so-called green organizations, the bargains that they do. It's a way of, of trying to get through the grieving, I think. Um, and the fourth stage of grief is depression, as you know. And if you start reading statistics about the state of mind of those who are concerned or alarmed about climate change, it's really scary. The Yale Climate Study is, is coming out with figures like 
how many of us, they're talking about us, are feeling um, hopeless? How many of us are feeling angry? How many of us are feeling despairing? The numbers are up 60, 70 percent. That just, that just can't be because we can't, um, we have to deal with the grief that we feel. And so I start turning to the ways in which we do deal with grief when it's a, a child who dies or, or when it's some other uh, entity that we deeply love, when, when the meadow we've been going to for years has been bulldozed. Um, what do we start with? We start with by coming together, don't we? As soon as you hear of a death, what do you do? You reach out to that person, you come together, you bring a casserole, um, and, and you spend time together and you talk about what you love. The second thing we do is we bring in our rituals of grieving. We bring in music, we bring in prayer, we bring in uh, raiment. In some cultures we bring in dancing. Um, and I believe that all of those are, are ways of, of, of making clear to ourselves that the grief that we feel is part of the rhythm of the world. And when the music comes sweeping into our soul, it's a universal grieving that that music brings. And it sweeps us up into a larger whole, and it makes us part of, of this community of, of living things, and so we're not alone anymore. So everything I've said so far is about not being alone in our grief. We can't be alone in our grief. And then what else do we do? We, we go outside, and we take long walks, we sit by rivers, we let the earth speak to us, another way in which the river can come right into our bodies and sweep us up and, and help us understand that this is the way of the world. So, so I think that the ways in which we deal with grief when it's a, a, a specific loss or death are the very ways that we can appeal to when we're talking about the grief we feel about the fate of, fate of the earth. The one thing we can't do is allow grief to go to its fifth stage and that is acceptance. We can't go there. I'll take that. Hi, my name's Lynn and I'm the Learning Garden Coordinator at St. Martin's in Olympia. And you answered my question in some ways. Um, uh, more and more people are suffering from depression and anxiety disorders. And if they go to their doctor, the doctor generally gives them some pretty heavy duty pharmaceuticals. And it's treated as a disease. When might it be an actual healthy or, or rational response to what they're losing, to what's happening? Or maybe an intuitive or even an unconscious response. And so maybe the things that you say, maybe sympathy groups, you know, where you get together and talk about what you could do, or what are your ideas as to, or what do you think of that, I guess is my question. Do you think that the depression and the anxiety that we are seeing in larger numbers, and especially in the younger population, might actually be a natural response rather than a disease? Good. Thank you. And you were standing there too. So, um, my name's Lori, and I'm involved in uh, I'm, I'm deeply involved and passionate about nonviolence. So uh, my question, um, which um, has to do with uh, the idea of marginalized people's groups um, be getting empowered. So bearing in mind that cliched generalizations are not solutions, um, how do we transfer the power of, for example, the Sierra Club to, for example, Idle No More? And so I would like to hear more specifics about um, how we who are comfortable can be allies for people who are already on the front lines. Thank you. Thank you. And one more and then we'll plug it up. Yeah. I guess the alternatives to capitalism is communism and socialism. Uh, communism in Russia, I guess, was a pretty much a failure, a uh, colossal failure perhaps. Socialism hasn't been able to stand up to capitalism. And uh, there's the other example is Communist China, which to uh, some extent has had uh, uh, considerable success and uh, I, I, I don't think has uh, backed down too much from uh, Western capitalism. And they've done some remarkable things. I'm thinking particularly the population problem in China, which they uh, uh, controlled by a uh, one-child policy, which uh, many people would disagree with is uh, opposed to fundamental freedoms, but it did solve an overpopulation problem. 
And I'm thinking that perhaps now with com, com, uh, communist China um, becoming uh, possibly the dominant world power, uh, if you see any um, future that that will influence the, uh, uh, our ideas of, uh, of a uh, uh, economic and social society uh, for the better. Thank you. So a question about grief is rational or natural um, transference of power from large groups to small groups and China's influence. First person gets the first topic. I, I choose grief. <laughs> Unless someone else wants it. You're not just going to say the same thing you just said, are you? As I said, no. <laughs> um, what I think part of what we're seeing is the failure, the ultimate failure of the bad ways of grieving that have been foisted on us. Let me make that clearer. What, what was President Bush's response to this massive grief over over the collapse of the towers, it was go shopping. And I don't think that's, that's any different from the distractions that were offered that would keep our attention away from grief. So, so it's not just shopping, it's sports, it's all the ways in which we don't pay attention. And so when we're, th there are certain kind of um, dysfunctional ways of dealing with grief. And one is in, in, in distracting ourselves. And, um, I think that the grief we feel is, is a marker of a failure, that that's not working for us anymore. Another thing that we do to fail to grieve functionally is, is to lie to ourselves. This isn't happening. And I think what we're seeing is this universal failure of that means of avoiding, avoiding encountering this. And another way in which we fail to grieve functionally is, is to turn our aggression inside or outside. Drugs, alcohol, aggression, and, and that's not working for us either. So yeah, I think it's quite natural that we're coming up against a, 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 the wall of grief, this wave of grief, is because all the ways in which we've avoided it so far are just not functioning for us. Um, I actually want to piggyback on that just a little bit because part of the question was about what is the cause of so much despondency, depression, uh, it maybe in some cases dysfunction, and. And I think there is a way in which watching the life around us suffering does cause that. Both human and natural life suffering, I think, does cause that. But I want to just add in a couple other things. I mean, one thing is that we're eating terrible food. Kids are eating really awful stuff. And there, you know, that, those chemicals really do alter the brain. And so if kids are, well, not just kids, people of all ages are on those kinds of diets, whether because of food deserts, whether because that's what they can afford, whether for whatever reason, um, they, do they do affect our sense of well-being and, and the actual chemistry of the brain. And so then to go to the doctor and have them recommend chemicals to counter these other chemicals is really, it, it strikes me as, as, a, as a real failing of our healthcare system. I mean, e everybody should have a chance to really get an immersive uh, diagnosis of their way of eating and their lifestyle before anybody <laughs> turns to chemicals, in my view. Um, <laughs> then the other thing is that, um, you know, there's a lot about how we live. We live a lot by ourselves. Many, many people are very isolated. I don't think we evolved to be isolated. I think people who are in contact with other people tend to tend to become more stabilized, and people who are in contact with the natural world, it tends to create a kind of psychological stability. So when you're locked inside your little apartment or your little cubicle at work alone or in front of a screen, I think that that uh, contributes to that too. And then we do Yes Magazine. We just did an issue on education, which will be uh, which will be out very soon, and. I was so struck by the, the you know, the, with the acceleration of standardized testing, you know, kids who are spending hours and hours and hours filling in little bubbles on little standardized tests, and then teachers who are forced to teach to those tests, so teaching a lot of rote material, to kids who are intrinsically wanting to be engaged in multiple and creative wor ways with their world. They, they are born needing that kind of engagement and needing that kind of you know, physical interaction, creativity, music, art, 
They need to be engaged in so many different ways, and if we force them to sit down and shut up and to do one boring thing for many, many hours, a lot of them have to be medicated. And that's what we're doing. So what we don't know is what is the long-term effect of, of asking young children with brains still very much in development to take a bunch of chemicals designed to change the chemistry of their brain. What's the long-term effect of that? And does that have those kinds of long-term implications? We, we actually don't know. We're doing a massive experiment on the next generation and, and we do not know what the outcomes of that are. Uh, well, quickly, I'll, I'll address the China question and, um, and, and say that that's, that's where Sarah's point about uh, being conscious of what we mean by capitalism uh, is, is relevant because um, for all intensive purposes, China hasn't been communist for, for quite a while. Um, they have more of a command and control capitalist economy, um, which means that um, they, have, they have most of the negative parts of capitalism um, along with the negative parts of, of an authoritarian government. Um, so I don't see, so I don't see their rise really changing anything significantly um, in terms of the discussion on, on capitalism um, because they, they have a pretty similar economy at this point. Um, it's just that uh, they're more open uh, sort of about the fact that um, they have a very small handful of people uh, it, that, they, that they call political leaders calling the shots, um, whereas in this country we have uh, a very small slice of, of what we call CEOs and lobbyists calling the shots. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty similar economic structure. Um, and, and then quickly to the question of um, what would it, how, do, how do we transfer that power um, to, to frontline groups? Um, from say institutions like the Sierra Club or 350, um, and I would say you at, you actually have to go to those frontline groups um, and and ask them how you can help. Um, and you know, as, as we were discussing over lunch, um, you know, part of part of the value of that suggestion of of having some groups in the mainstream part of the climate movement, the well-funded groups, shut down. Um, is having those folks that have all, that have had that very comfortable NGO position, um, and that have been the people um, in powerful positions in this movement who controlled purse strings, uh, have to go to those traditionally oppressed communities um, with a little bit of insecurity of finding our place in that, um, and and us finding a way to fit into their organizing. Um, which is what people of color have been doing on the left in a for a long time. Um, and that's part of the value. That's, that's part of why this would be a useful thing, um, is for, for those of us who uh, are not used to being uncomfortable uh, in those sort of situations, uh, to have to go to those traditionally oppressed people um, and us being in the more disempowered position um, and, and not trying to fit them into our agenda, um, not trying to, to use them, um, but actually seeing what we can do to help. Um, so I'm not the one who can answer that. Uh, you'd, you'd have to go to them. We have time for one, one more question. Hi. Um, my name is Max, I'm an OSU student, and um, in my journey um, of awakening as an individual, I've come across many people in the environmental movement who have been embrazened by passion and inspiration and fueled by in idealism, who have failed to implement change on the community level because of a lack of in infrastructure in this movement. So my question for you is in this time when the predominant structure is failing us, where should we be putting our attention so that we can live in a sustainable community in the future? Well, 
one of the most exciting things that I've taken part in in recent months is this coming together of the climate action groups in Corvallis around a vision of Corvallis as um, a fossil free, a zero emissions uh, community uh, within a certain number of years. And the way in which, I don't know, Carly, how many, how many different organizations were there? There's a lot of organizations in this town. And when they came together, <laughs> I beg your pardon? Over 30. Uh, that's amazing in a town this size, it's wonderful. And when these people all came together in the same room, they had to get a very big room. And when they started talking about what they were doing and what might they might do together, it was th thrilling. It was just thrilling. And, uh, and now I think Carly and, and others, um, Annette are, and, and many others, are working towards how, how these organizations in Corval or Corvallis can come together around a plan that will absolutely transform this community. So um, it would be wonderful to see students involved in that effort as well. Um, I don't think anyone can say for anybody else how to get involved. I think that becoming, becoming active, becoming part of our, the solution if you aren't already, I think draws on the gift that you bring, as Kathy was speaking about earlier. It draws on your passion. It draws on who you know and what you want to get involved in. I think, you know, that, that we have to be in some ways led by our heart to, to do the right thing. And then, then we have the passion and the energy to really get involved deeply and to take the risks and to continue and to inspire our friends. Because I think one of the things that we know is that people learn f most from each other about things like the climate crisis. They trust each other and they trust each other, they trust people when they see that kind of authenticity coming through. So I would say follow the thing that you are most passionate about and you're almost certain to find a few other people who are similarly passionate and then go for it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can, we can offer real specifics about exactly what an individual should do, um, but we can offer perspectives that, um, that are good ways to go about answering that for yourself. Um, and for me, there's, there's two sets of things that um, I think should be held in tension uh, with each other um, a as we go about looking for how to be most effective at um, building truly sustainable communities. Um, the big word that I've learned in Harvard Divinity School so far is dialectical tension, um, which, which means uh, uh, ho ho holding tension between uh, two, c two poles that, that are both necessary, that must be held in balance, and that when one of them gets out of balance, um, having the other is not as, as useful. Um, and, and, and so one of those is the sort of local to global perspective. Um, and the things that I think need to be held in tension there are resilience and resistance um, that, that need to go hand in hand, um, wh which is sort of another way of saying the, uh, the localization and the globalization of, 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 the, of the movement, um, because the resilience is usually the building local communities that are, that are self-sustaining part of it, and the resistance is sort of going to where the heart of injustice is and fighting the heart of that injustice. Um, and I think they always need to go hand in hand um, because you can't, have, you can't have one without the other. Um, and, you know, we've, we've certainly seen examples um, where if all you have is, is resistance, you have nothing to really replace whatever it is you're fighting um, and you have no real foundation to stand on then um, if you're only resisting. Um, you need the resilience in, in terms of building that institution the new institution that, that replaces the old one as you overthrow it. Um, and, and it goes in the other direction as well. Um, any, any resilience that is not resistance at the same time um, is just short-term thinking. Um, you know, and, and you can look at, um, at the really nice progressive uh, sustainable communities that are being built um, it, you know, in places like Vermont or perhaps uh, Corvallis, um, and you know, you you go to a place like uh, like West Virginia uh, or Black Mesa, um, and and they call that 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 isolated resilience um, without uh, the isolated resilience that doesn't also fight back uh, against injustice. 
Um, they call that waiting your turn. Um, because you can build a nice little sustainable community uh, right here if you're not in the path of that corporate machine that's chewing up and eating communities in other parts of the country. Um, but if you're not standing up for those other communities that are in the path of destruction right now, um, whether they be in, in Richmond or, or Black Mesa or uh, you know, all these places where injustice is happening on the front line, um, you're just waiting your turn. Um, because once those companies have eaten everything they wanted out of those communities, they'll come for you. Um, you know, it's, I think it's worth remembering that this country was once covered with sustainable local communities, um, Native American communities, and they pretty much all got destroyed because you can't have a sustainable community right next to an unsustainable community for long because once the unsustainable community uh, eats its own house, then it'll come eat your house. Um, it'll, it'll keep eating, um, and, uh, it, and you need that resistance piece. Um, and the other things that need to be held in tension, um, as some of us were talking about this morning, um, is, the, is the real community building and relationship building, um, and the dialogue part of things, and then the action of actually uh, getting stuff done, moving forward. Um, those need to be held in tension as, as well. Um, and I was talking about it in terms of uh, riding a bike. You need both the balance, like the, the, the healthy relationships and the internal dialogues and that sort of thing, um, and, and you need the forward momentum. Um, and if you try to just get your balance perfect on a bike before you start pedaling, you'll never start pedaling because you'll, never, you'll always be wobbling a little bit. Um, and, and you can uh, you know, sit with a community and just try to work on your relationships amongst each other um, and get those perfect, uh, and you'll never start doing anything because those won't be perfect. It takes the forward momentum, the action, uh, to help work on those relationships. So you gotta, you gotta walk and talk at the same time.